and then you have to be like the chat master because yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't have, have... Well, 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 I, I, myself. Myself. I am going to be the chat master and now it's quarter past so we can start. So there are like 30 people online and like 10 people here. So last time we had a bit more people, but it doesn't matter. This is for you. You can write your name and uh, student number so I can give you the uh, po points of visiting this visiting lecture. And those who are online, just write your name in the chat. So then I will have the Zoom chat log that I can check that, okay, you have been in this lecture. So then, then, then I can give you the points. And after this visiting lecture, there will be the essay task. So something about this lecture, you can then write the essay about that. And I, I am right now recording this and hopefully we will manage to record the whole show. No crashes of any kind. So then, then this will be available also in some kind of a uh, video format in some system. But now it's time to give the floor to Pekkis and hear what he has uh, has to say this year, how the web has developed the past 30 years as me and Pekkis we have been. In today we can say that we, we were the uh, Korpimaat Star Trek. Mit, mit, uh, frontiers, frontiers. frontiers. We, we were visiting the frontiers in the 90s and now it's 30 years later. And, and, and it's, it's still, still like a frontier. frontier. Yeah, and... it is. But in the 90s, it, it, it didn't felt in the same way. It was OK, we are doing something in the web, but now we know that we were the first ones. But let's let's give the floor mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. Pekis. Thank, thank you. Man. Thank you. Hello. Hello. I'm, I'm not going to keep the video open because I'm not going to stand here, but I just opened the video for you to see that I am I am a human and not an, not artificial intelligence so so and I yes I have done this presentation myself and not with generative AI so this is kind of old school so hello and yes yes I came to uh, talk to you about the web and I'm going to talk about the web in general and 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 of work life and uh, anything that I would consider to be useful for students uh, aiming to work in our great IT field. But yes, I've been working in the web for in four different decades now already. It sounds sounds much longer because four decades have been like <laughs> not every every one of them was so long but yeah I, I i consider myself a generalist who likes to know about everything that there is to know about our field and i also like to teach and mentor people and write about coding and and make noise about it because i i love the web and i love love my work very much and yeah currently i'm working at the uh finnish national uh, gambling monopoly and we have this nice time box project there that we are going to break up the monopoly. We are going to have a free market on the, I don't know, gambling is the word that I'm using, but that all the money games. Uh, so interesting project, I think. But hey, yes, uh, the roots of the web go to the, to the 1800s, of course. Here's a picture of Adal. Ada Lovelace programming the first program with his with her nice laptop uh, in the in in, <clears throat> in the Victorian London in candlelight very very romantic uh, and then a little bit later in the 1960s this guy called Ted Nelson invented hypertext as a as a concept and hypermedia and he started the project called Xanadu. But the Xanadu project never flew. And actually, he released a beta version or alpha version of Xanadu in 2014, but it led to nothing. And most people say that Nelson was pretty insane. But this famous documentarist and actor, Werner Herzog, suggests in his own doc documentary in that he's actually the only sane person. I'm not one to judge. 
But Ted Nelson liked that description a lot. It's a nice little uh, bit of video if you want to look at it. But I was not sadly a part of the Xanadu project because I was born in 1978. And here is a picture of me coding my first web pages in, in that same, same year. I had this little baby computer. And in 1990, 1989, 1991, uh, HTML was invented in CERN to share scientific documents inside CERN. So that is where HTML uh, got invented. And they published it all in public domain in 1993, which was pretty, pretty nicely done because the rest is, of course, history. And this slide is here just to orient you that if you want to work uh, in the web, you should know this protocol because this protocol is the same that it was in 1990s. And we are in the business of like uh, making HTTP requests and, and receiving responses. And even though there's some new versions of this protocol in on top of the old one, it's still the same. And if somebody would have said to me when I was learning that, that the stuff that try to learn the protocol, uh, all the methods and the caching and stuff like that, it would have been easier for me. So take care of like understanding what, what this stuff is about. And then after uh, they released their codes, Netscape was this original startup. They invented basically the current uh, way of working for the uh, startups. They found a company and they only make losses and then their valuation is like 100 billion dollars and then they get an IPO and and everybody gets rich and then they crash and burn uh, and they re released a the first uh, commercial web browser called Netscape Navigator in 1994 and this is where web really got going and and then after I think that my slide is in the wrong order, but it doesn't matter. Uh, then they got into this competition where they, they invented new features for the uh, web. And JavaScript was invented or coded by this Brendan Eich guy in two weeks' time in an actual dark closet because they had to release something. And that is why JavaScript is maybe a little bit weird because it's it's just like a quick hack and prototype. And it was supposed to be taken over by Java because uh, does anybody talk about Java nowadays anymore? I, You do. Do you learn it in school? Nice. Everyone knows Java. Yeah. But nobody is doing anything with Java in the web. But it was supposed to be like the lingua franca of the programming world that everybody is for using Java and operating system, systems are made with Java. Everything is made with Java. Uh, but but the, the problem was that the computers of the time were too slow for it. I think that they're still too slow for it, probably. <laughs> but well, yeah, but but in any case, it it couldn't work back then, and they needed something. And so they invented this JavaScript that was a marketing ploy. They took the name from JavaScript. They took Java. Uh, they took took the syntax from C. But the actual inspiration for the language came from different places. So it's like this terrible abomination. But for some miracle, I think that they got the important bits right after the two weeks. So it's nice. But in any case, it was like considered a toy and an evil for the longest of time. And yeah, then the third part of this uh, tech stack that we have, CSS was invented in the same time, just about 1995 and six. And I don't know if anybody remembers these times, you're probably too young for it, but we used to do very weird stuff with HTML and style it with these tags, like text is green and BG color is orange and centering and stuff like that. And it broke the way that HTML worked because HTML wants to say the what the content is and not the way it looks. So they had to invent something uh, to separate the presentation from the content. And so CSS was born. And this led to this first browser war where uh, Netscape uh, managed to awaken the beast of Microsoft 
uh, and they competed fiercely and Microsoft won and they waged a cruel and total war against everything. And this was the time when, when those people at Microsoft said that Linux is a cancer and, and it has to be destroyed and, and Microsoft was considered the, the biggest evil. And I find it really funny because today uh, the war is actually over and Microsoft won and I'm basically a Microsoft developer because everything I use in my daily work uh, GitHub and NPM and TypeScript and VS Code, they are all done by Microsoft and owned by Microsoft. So, so in the end, they won. And if you consider some early art from those days, I always want to show this Space Jam. This is the site of the original Space Jam movie. And I go and watch my own I have everything saved that I have ever done in the web. And I go to look at my stuff from 1996 and 1997 and, and from those days, and they look like this, and I get this what is myötä häpeä. Like, You're ashamed of I'm, I'm ashamed of like for the person who did it. But then when I go, this is made by the uh, most brilliant professionals of the time. And it was just that the website looked like this. I don't know where the black background and red or yellow text came from, but that is that was the core scheme of the day. Dark mode was <laughs> prevalent in, in those days. So yeah, it, that's just how they looked. Here's the, uh, for one of the first web pages in Finland of Yle. And it's nice that, that these still exist and they are online like browsable and i think that this is the this is the like the one most fundamental thing that you have to understand about the web and why it is uh, how it is it's because there's this 30 years of backward compatibility that can never be broken nobody is going to fix anything in the browser that is broken because then those 30 year old sites would not work anymore so we can only add on top of stuff that we already have. Uh, maybe the best example of this is the date library of JavaScript. It's from the first beta version of Java. And Java fixed that in 1996, and we still have it because you can't take it away. They are making a new one, but the old one can never be removed because the, that's just how the web works. You have to support everything from, from the early 1990s I think that oh and I don't have the first ever web page here but yeah it doesn't matter but in in any case I was of course like pretty young I was in high school in those days and I like to play lots of games in the 80s of course like everybody did there's my first home computer the bread box is in the corner and and finally I wanted to play these ice hockey manager games and there were none and I had to make them myself and and for some legal some reason people like your teacher like like those games pretty much and that's how I got started in the in the programming scene yeah lots of people actually gave well not lots of people but many people <laughs> yeah but maybe first tens of thousands but but it was big money for like a student of course it was like incredible I, it, it deemed whether I ate like the moldy bread or the good bread <laughs> and yeah it was nice and then those were also the days that I made my first uh, web pages but I didn't like making those niche games wasn't like a good end game plan so I just accidentally stumbled into into a school to learn me some like multimedia production because those CD-ROMs they were like the hottest thing of the 1990s and 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 it was a good idea so yeah but the message that we got was that we have to study some HTML for maybe a couple of months and then we get a well-paying job job in the dot-com business and that was like the plan so you are not going to be here in the school uh, for very long and here are some pictures of my first workplace here's my first uh lamborghini that i learned and 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 then there's like the dot-com boom in the right there right and it's a pretty realistic picture we were having great fun and 
everybody, everybody got rich. So, of course, what actually happened uh, after two months in school was this: that the dot-com bubble burst, and then we then there was this, there were these people coding HTML for food in the streets. So the times got a lot harder, and I I, I think that it's an, it's a, it's interesting to compare those days to these current days because I I, I sense the same thing that. The times are much harder. There are like masses of juniors in the field. The, the, the number of applications that, that different companies get from the juniors, it's like, it's, it's very big. It's, it's, and after reading some success stories in LinkedIn for 15 years, now I see these stories where people are getting laid off and people in the consultancy business say that they've been on bench, meaning that you don't have a project for a year. And it's like incredible because there were like 10 so good years that you could grab people from the street and put them to code and make money with that. And so it's very, very different, but I'm sure that again, uh, times will get better somehow, but yeah, it's an, <clears throat> it's an interesting comparison. But I didn't matter because I wanted, well, was in school and I really got hooked by, by web development and I practiced it a lot and started from small and, and then got inspired by something. But the times were pretty boring those years. Mon nothing much happened because this Bill Gates guy uh, had this dream and when the dream came through, nothing really happened. Because Netscape folded, Internet Explorer was the only browser. It had something like 99% of the market share in its greatest. And I, that's another other, uh, interesting thing because the browser market always seems to want to converge on one browser that eats all. And uh, the best thing that we could do for the open web today is to use Firefox, but nobody is doing that because everybody is just using Chrome because it's convenient. But we we really should remember these days when there was only one and the monopoly. Google only wants to make money on our information. And uh, I'm not sure whether Firefox is much better, but they're a little bit better, I think. But in any case, Microsoft didn't develop uh, Internet Explorer anymore. So nothing happened. CSS got a little better, um, but Nothing happened with JavaScript or, or the web in general. And the coolest thing that people would do these days were these content management applications where you can edit the content of your corporate website without a coder coding. And this was the coolest thing. And everybody in those days started with by doing their own content management systems. I did something like maybe 10 different content management systems in the days, but nowadays it's a solved problem, <laughs> who cares? But, but in those days, it was like the application of that day. But yeah, then I got a little bit lucky because I finished in school in 2003 and I got the best worst first workplace ever. I've, I've written like uh, five, part memoirs of those days in, in, in Finnish. Oh, I'm so young. Why, why am I so young? <laughs> They're not so young anymore, but younger than today. But in any case, it was a terrible uh, workplace. If it was a server room, this would be the server room. Everything was like hell and nobody knew what they were doing. In those days, it was like possible. You see that Today, of course, for example, you remember the Vastamo case where they stole the patient information of people. And I know from some people that that software was basically done like this old school crap, crap fest. But usually nowadays you can't manage with that. But, but in those early days, you could do basically anything and nobody cared because nobody knew what to do. But yeah, I think that it was nice that I didn't sleep well because it was terrible. But now when I look back, 
I learned a lot because I had to do things that I didn't understand because there was nobody else. So it was nice. Of course, a mentor would have been probably nicer and, and softer, but but yeah. But poetic justice, Microsoft, Microsoft wanted to destroy the web, but they ended up uh, saving it by accident. They had this XML HTTP request API in Windows update hidden. And somebody noticed that they can refresh the screen without doing a full page reload. And this was like magical and, and not possible on those days. And they took that uh, data, <clears throat> that API, the other browser vendors and implemented it in their browsers. And this is how the web application such as we know it today was actually born. And this led to those first uh, libraries that were used were trying to make the browser coding like understandable. For example, jQuery. jQuery, they released a version 4 beta, actually, last week, I think. So it's a long-lived uh, library, and it was born in these days. An excellent, excellent library that nobody has any reason to use anymore. But I think that 70% of top 10 websites still do. But yeah, again, my, my luck was good because I ended up on this uh, real estate a startup called Ego. And we, they spent a terrible amount of money and it was all gone. It was like blowing it through with a leaf blower from the windows. We had, or they had uh, a castle in the neighborhood of Norwegian King in Oslo. And they had like sports cars and, and stuff. But we had an excellent team and we did uh, stuff that was five years ahead of the curve. But my ears would probably bleed if I would remember how terrible the development experience of these days were. But in any case, um, this led to the second browser war where JavaScript was suddenly very uh, important, but it was terrible. It was shit. And again, these browser vendors released their new browsers and it culminated in Google releasing this Chrome that I already talked about. And in, in Chrome, there was this V8 JavaScript engine that was the first good one. And at the same time, Apple, of course, invented the smartphone. Uh, iPhone, the first iPhone came out and this moved like web from the only the desktop to mobile too. And rise of all the social media and and stuff like that. HTML was again rebooted and, and many, many inventions uh, happening after a long time. And the browser ultimately made, made Microsoft and Windows like pretty irrelevant. Nobody cares anymore. And then I think that there was a renaissance. I had a renaissance of myself because I had a, a burnout. It doesn't like have to be a big subject uh, in this presentation, but it's like relevant in our field where people, you can never be finished and you can always more, work more and be more efficient and you can never, never like feel satisfied in your own work. So you just have to remember like to take breaks and, and, and try to look after yourselves. And sadly, you can't teach this to people, I think. You have to learn it the hard way. But, but I would suggest that everybody try to like look out for themselves. But in any case, after the burnout, we found our own company called Fractio because we got tired, pretty tired of the, our employer, new owners running the business to the ground. And there's also a lesson to be learned there because we were all sued by our uh, former employers when, when we formed found our own company because of these pesky non-competition clauses. Nowadays, the law says that you have to be compensated for the time you can compete. But I would still, still suggest that never put your name on any non-competition cl clause like that because they're like evil and they don't like hold hold in courts and and it's like really stupid don't don't write but yeah and also more important the javascript 
got to the Renaissance point. Some, this Ryan Dahl guy, he took the V8 engine out of the chrome and created no chains with it. And this is how Node was born. And when Node was born, uh, they had to make a package furniture and to build on top of that. So it's easier, it's very easy then to build on top of things that somebody has built. And the JavaScript snowball was like rolling. And then there, there was this disruption of the scene. I think that if you, if you look at the web, it's 30 years. Uh, the first one, the point was the Ajax thingy and the birth of the web application as such. And then I think that this is like the second revolution point of in 2013 when they released React because, well, I'll get to it in a, in a moment, but it was, when you look back now, it seems like really odd, but they were laughed off the stage first. And, and the people were, were saying that this is insane and this will never fly. And they, they are re reinventing all the wheels and they were too cocky, but they took a new strategy later on and started to like preach about it, why they reinvent all the wheels. And I, this is when, when I encountered this uh, revolution in 2014, we lost a big case with our company because we didn't know enough of React. And then I found out and I came to the conclusion that this is going to disrupt the scene. And I was like all in from that moment. And of, th of course, the wisdom of, of hindsight said that, that, that I'm correct. But in those days, it wasn't so clear. But yeah, this is just from my training materi materials that they explain uh, why I think nowadays that that this disruption was happening. It was just these paradigms of getting user interface from state and using components and everything being JavaScript. That is the genius uh, of this, this JSX thing with React is that I'm always coding in JavaScript and I get to be a better coder. And that is why I, I believe in this because the context is always JavaScript and then you get to be a better coder. And later on, they realized that they actually invented a new abstraction for all kinds of user interfaces for mobile apps and 3D stuff. And even videos, something like Remotion is like rendering videos with React. And I don't understand how it work, works, but again, the abstraction of the user interface is the same. And it popularized lots of these early uh, mega trends that have lost all meaning after 10 years. But again, this has been the place where the innovation has been happening uh, in our scene for the last 10 years, basically. So nowadays, now we are again in place where, where the user interface libraries have matured and the evolution has moved into one level more up, like in these meta frameworks and stuff. And of course, when, when things get like on a high le higher level, they get more complex and more hard and, and the abstraction rises and moves the complexities to different places. And also this is one thing that is, going, is happening now. If I would choose like a second skill now, I would pick something like Rust because they are building the infrastructure of the web now on Rust and Go and stuff that is not JavaScript. So it's hard to not see a disruption there because it's like instant. Who wants to wait for two seconds when you can wait for one millisecond? And that's again, like the level of disruption that is hard to avoid. But React won in any, any case, and now we are in the place. It's, this is a recurring theme in the field again. Uh, when something is good and popular, people start to bash it. And they say that something is something because it's only popular because it's popular. But I don't think that that's true. They have forget, forgotten the history that I talked about. But again, now, uh, it's more full stack again. The first thing that, that we wanted to do in the web was that please take 
everything out of the server mm -hmm. because we want to code in JavaScript everywhere. So we wanted to move everything uh, to the client, the browser. And then when it happened, now we are in the in the state where we are saying that please put everything back into the server, but now with this one unified stack of JavaScript and TypeScript. And, and so it's always this cyclical thing that is going on that we want something, we get it, we want the other old thing back. And it's always going on with everything. And, but there is, I think, point in this. If we look at how, how we have been doing things, this is like a simplification of the stuff that has been in, in this year. So this is 1993. This left side of the screen is like my computer, the author's computer. And then there's some server in the middle and then there's the user of the stuff in the right. So of course, Tim started everything and he authored these HTML files in his own machines. And then he had to code all the servers and all the web browsers and everything so somebody could uh, watch the content. And this is still in use, this methodology. It's called static site generation. So you just have static files that are generated by somebody with something and then that's it. And the next evolution was that stuff got uh, dynamic and nothing happened in the like pre author, there was some database and some Sege Scribuatio that took requests, and, and everybody, every request got their own response generated in the server, and then it served. So, this is server side rendering. A, again, a, a word that is being using, it's in use today. And this got like more complex when you got CSS and you got JavaScript, but it was still the same. Every, everything just grew and, and got more complex and JavaScript is still a toy, okay? And it's used to trolling people. And then you get to the stage where you have stuff like PHP and, and something like this, and it's, it's getting forward and the boxes are getting bigger. And then you get to the stage where, where most of the stuff is happening in these big frameworks in the server and JavaScript and HTML and CSS, they are like relegated to doing little things and, and the servers and different languages are doing, doing the, the heavy lifting. But then they invent this after the Ajax revolution, they invent this uh, single page application or client side rendering. Everything is like being authored as big JavaScript blobs and pushed to the client. And the client is then uh, communicating with JSON with these little, little tiny uh, servers that do stuff. So most is on the client side, okay? But nowadays we have this where everything is generated here and it's terrible blobs that, that nobody understands. A lot of JavaScript is being moved and, and everything is built on the server and then it's built again in the client. And this is, the, this is like the situation that we have today that it's grown like this terrible demon's ball that is called hydration. And this is where we are now. And this is the problem that they are trying to solve now. And Again, cyclical, they want to move back to the PHP world where they, you have this type system JavaScript, which is like both in the author side and in the server, and then it generates all these stuff in, in the server. And the JavaScript is again relegated in the client side to like do the interactions. And when you compare this terrible thing and you this elegant thing, I can understand that that stuff is always evolving. And when they have this, they want something else. But yeah, I'm, you can tell probably because I want, I like to talk about the front end a lot because I've been spending my time there in the front end and the back end of front end for, for 10 years because I like to code in the browser because I, I want to see what happens and, and it, it just feels good to um, see stuff. But in any case, if you think of this evolution in the server world, what does the chat say, by the way? Everything is cool. I can be interrupted, but we'll have lots of time to discuss. I'm, I'm aiming for a half hour of discussion, hopefully. 
I don't have any hurry. But <clears throat> yeah, so the evolution of servers. I like the first thing mostly, uh, most that you had these servers in the basement. Each of these servers had a name and you logged into the servers and you had to be kind to the server and, and pet the server and make uh, and hope that it doesn't break. And they were like these unique slow, snowflakes. But then because needs grew, you had multiple servers and you had, had clusters of servers. And, and finally you had virtual servers because nobody was managing the mass of these snowflakes. And then you got to the virtual servers in the cloud, of course. And you have these mega frameworks that I showed in the picture. They, they were replaced by these simple micro frameworks in the, in the server and REST and JSON APIs. And then you get to these service, services and containers like Docker. And then you, then you have platforms for managing these containerized workloads and services like Kubernetes, which is like its own hellscape. I, I pity those who have to work, work in, in there, but they seem to like the torment that they have chosen. And then there's like serverless computing, like functions as a service. So you can, you can create all kinds of uh, micro and macro front ends with these ones, and they all go to hell in time. And code is now, infrastructure is now hopefully code because code is, you can just replicate it. And it, now, now in the last few years, we have been talking a lot, lot about edge computing. So edge, do you know what edge is? Can somebody explain edge computing? It's like the cloud, but it's 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 in the behind the corner. It's brought like close to the user, and it's basically how it does it. It's is these content delivery networks that every of these uh, big providers have. They are like mostly idling their machines that are delivering like static content from near you, and they have lots of like unused uh, computing power available so they have created these functions that can be run in the in the next neighborhood to you and it's like really simple tiny runtimes you can't do everything there but it's like really close so there's a low latency and and lots of good good stuff going on there and then there's of course uh, this for example this Hanmaya Hanson who has this what is it 30 37 signals they were cool as kids in, in the block back in the days when Ruby on Rails was the biggest thing, but they exited from the cloud totally. They again have their machines in their own basement. So that's not something I would recommend to all people, but you can save like a pretty penny by doing it yourself. So again, it's always this great cycle cycling that, that these trends come and go. And everything always goes to hell. And then they say that it's the, it's the fault of the paradigm, even though it's always like the fault of the people not understanding. <laughs> but yeah. So in pictures, when I started, this was how it was. The front end was nice and cool, nice and cool. And, and back end had, had the demons. And then at some point, oh, the back end was nice and smooth and the front end was terrible. And of course, what the truth is now is that it, it's all terrible. So it's all monsters all around. And this is what the web has always been that, that, yeah. But why all these changes? It's of course the scale because Facebook has a billion users and in the 1990s, probably 10 users was a lot. So you can't do the stuff that we used to do nowadays, or you can, if you have a little audience, but the mega people, but yeah. But growing a business was also about scale. And I enjoyed running my, my company, our company with my friends, but I did lots of stuff that was not uh, coding. So I did sales and, and teaching and mentoring and recruiting and marketing and whatever there was to do. So I got pretty tired of that. And so I sold all my shares in my company uh, just before the corona. I'm really happy that I wasn't like an entrepreneur in the corona times. It was, 
just lucky, pure luck. But I think that I would have gotten a heart attack. Uh, but yeah, and I was a consultant for a couple of years, but the consultant, uh, being a consultant for somebody else when you had your own consultant didn't like offer really big thrills. So I decided to try something else. I, I went to Ulens for you, uh, which is the national broadcasting company of Finland. And I thought that I don't need to be mistreated by salespeople. I can choose my own failures. And that is what I did. And yeah. And I was there. But I got in last summer, I got into a surprise ethical disagreement with, with my well, our units management. I decided that fuck this, I'm not going to stand this. You can be assholes on yourself if you want, but but I mean I'm luckily in my career at the point where I don't like have to take it. And <laughs> earlier I said that I'm not going back to vehicles anymore because I didn't like that, but hey. You, you never know what happens and, and now, now I'm there and I'm dismantling mon the monopoly because it's an interesting project. So never say never and what <laughs> the odds would have been little, but, but yeah, interesting times. But in any case, if I have, I think that I have something, something to teach about the work in general. So that's what I'm, I'm going to talk about. So when I started, in the early 2000s, here were like the expectations of, of what you had to know. A little bit of, uh, or pretty much, I think, well, you had to learn HTML, CSS, some PHP or some other programming language, some databases. You, I think that you still learn relational databases. Of course. What are the databases that you are using? Learning. I well, MongoDB isn't a relational database. It's a yes, yes. That is my teaching. Nobody has ever been uh, fired by choosing PostgreSQL. You can't go wrong. It will do what you ask of it. <laughs> it's a. It's always like if you don't have any reason that you understand to choose something else to store your data, in, always choose PostgreSQL. So that is nice. But yeah, some JavaScript was expected, but nobody understood how to code JavaScript. Everybody did it wrong and badly. And it was pain. It was like physical pain to do it. And yeah, then you had to know Linux and servers and stuff like that. And if I think of the expectations that we have from colleagues or juniors now, of course you have to know everything that I knew. And you have to learn version control, but you, I, I'm suspecting that you use Git. Everybody is using Git. Hopefully, you learn Git and databases and stuff like that, and and the cloud. But there's more, and there's so much more that I don't like understand how much more there is. But I think that it's still these like same skills, and I think that this roadmap site actually has a pretty realistic uh, roadmap of the stuff and the order that you have to learn. I think that this is one of the better sites and there's infinitely more to learn, I think, but at least there are infinitely more information and re resources to learn than what I had. Hell, the internet connections were so slow when I learned this stuff that I had to download everything to offline because then I could close my dial-up modem and do some coding. And so there was no YouTube, there was no nothing. There was just like the black screen and, and trial and error. So yeah. And I, of course you don't have to know everything instantly all the time, but I still would suggest that you don't like skip these steps because even though you can achieve uh, enormous things with this, for example, these AI tools, but they give wrong results. They don't make always good code. And they're like, they should be your helper and not your teacher. They don't teach you the correct stuff. And that's where, what I'm, I'm wary about, that, that you can't skip the steps because 
uh, then you don't understand what you are doing. And then you make bad code and bad infrastructure and your project will fail. And my advice would be, my, my, my most important secret is that you learn to code by coding and practice makes perfect. So I would suggest that you just brew some coffee or grab an energy drink, and then you find something that you are interested in, in coding and evolving for like weeks and months and years, because then you have some interesting context to evolve yourself and, and try out new things. And it's much more nicer if you have something that you you like to do. And yes, but I, I haven't done a new one in 24 years. <laughs> Ooh, who is doing? No, no one's doing, but if someone... Wants yeah, to yeah, yeah. I would be glad to give up like the rank of the first the, the bestest one because it's been a long time but yeah and then just keep the roadmap uh, or some some something that you keep track of your success always like or your advances open and in your mind and then code and then you get frustrated because you don't know and understand something and and it's a big frust frustration i remember that it was really hard in the, in the beginning it's really hard now but it was like even harder in the be beginning and then you figure it out and you code some more and then you like loop these four to six for 25 years and then you will be me and also remember to take breaks and exercise because ah uh, ah uh, oh uh, otherwise your, your body and neck will hurt when you are 45 so and this is something that you have to get used to, that you always feel like this dog because you don't know, know what you're doing and, and everything. Nothing ever works and then you have to debug and it's weird. And I think that I've, that I've done 20 years of tech recruiting uh, in different contexts and it has taught me that I believe in this hobbyism and dedication and practice and web development is not rocket science. And it's just like, grinding and learning a lot about a lot of things but i never need algorithms basically if i need an algorithm i grab it from the web or ask uh, what this diploma is in early, you people science. master of science i asked those master of science guys for my algorithms so it's just grinding and, and knowing like lots about lots but yeah and programming is harder and it gets harder the more you know. The more you do it, the, le the more you understand that the less you know. And someone is always better and, and smarter and more efficient and stuff like that. And yeah, there's some just listed uh, some hobby projects of mine. I did this, for example, this code advent calendar. I, I mean, they're like my kind goodness level is ba gone bad because i opened the hatches in advance so that's why it shows me this evil picture but yeah there's music and stuff and it started from me wanting to do learn how to make that opening patch in cs and it just like grew from there and then i had two weeks of time and it became like a investigation in generative ai and stuff like that so it was nice. I didn't sleep much in two weeks, but because I had created myself in more, enormous pressure, but, but it was fun and I learned a lot. So of course I don't, I have to sleep because I'm 45. I can't do those all nighters anymore as much. Uh, somebody said that coder is like a race horse. You have to like flog it on while it still can run. And then you, put it to sausage factory when it's old <laughs> and it's it's in a way in a sense it's true when i when you are young you you can sleep less but yeah i talked about databases already postgresql is nice relational databases are nice there are lots of other databases nowadays and you have to understand where which data model fits them and stuff like that but but yeah and of course these are the in in the web uh, context. These 
full stack developers are the stuff that people want because one is more useful when when one can do everything but there's so much to know about ev anything nowadays that i don't think that you can like be hold all the hats at once anymore but you can always like jump between the roles and an interesting role i think is the that the role of design and development is like going they are converging and so you can approach this from a designer perspective and i think that these people who can both design and do front end are kind of unicorns now because they can achieve a lot it doesn't mean that designers are like by nature good developers or the other way but if somebody is good in both it's I, I like those people. I don't do design. I can't draw like, or I'm like functionally co colorblind. I can do brutal design. And that, that is like the limit of my knowledge. Uh, but yeah. And then there's of course the DevOps side with servers and then maintaining the service. Uh, oftentimes it's the, it's the developers and the DevOps team that do, do it together. But like uh, there, there's lots, of stuff there like the infrastructure in code and the kubernetes things and and yeah but in in the like worst case scenario you need to know how to work in unix terminals and and not use windows is nobody is using windows in the field if if somebody is using a windows machine at work people actually they laugh at them so and, and none of these platforms even work if you try to run something in the windows it doesn't run the subsystem linux subsystem has made it lots better and i do my hobby coding at home with my gaming machine because i have the linux inside the windows and it's like it works really well but like in native windows bleh. yeah lots of stuff in the cloud services and services and more services and micro front ends and, and uh, it never but yeah, security is, of course, important. The more you go to the back end, the security gets more important. I do mostly front end. I don't have to care about security because nothing really secure happens in the client side anyways, because the servers do that. But but yeah, I talked about the Vastamo case. Uh, so if you do stuff wrong, it can go terribly, terribly wrong for yourself and the other peoples in, involved. So... I've been teaching that uh, in the past, but for example, the OWASP top 10, which is the legendary resource for web security holes. I've forgotten everything that I learned. I, I, need, I need teaching now myself. But I think that everything, just understand that everything is always a compromise and common sense and, common sense and keep it simple, stupid are often enough. And the more that you, invest the the more the smaller your returns get you can just always compromise and of course nowadays the mobile development is you can do mobile with uh, web tech and i find that this is the holy grail i i believe in santa claus and and progressive web applications and linux desktops and and all these pipe dreams that we have I believe in them and I want to believe in them. And it was supposed to be that Apple was supposed to be supporting uh, notifications and, and stuff like that in the newest uh, iOS or what's the name of the operating system now. But actually I read last week that it's only gotten worse. Now they prevent all progressive web applications opening their own windows and they force them to open in Safari and 50% of the capabilities of those applications is now gone. And this is because Apple is being forced in the European Union, they say, to allow uh, other rendering platforms in their browser. And then when they say that you can't render the progressive web applications in these new platforms, then they still have their app store and their money. So it's just probably some ploy by Apple to circumvent the European Union's regulations. But yeah, and when you do the nice hobby projects, you can always 
use the tech that you want and the newest and coolest stuff. But not all projects in the field are, of course, greenfield. And, and all code uh, turns into legacy in, in some weeks, months, or years. And, and because everything is always changing, then there's always this need for uh, refactoring. And like I said, design. Nowadays, they have these design systems and, and component libraries and stuff like that. There's a lots of stuff going, in the going on in the design. Like I, like I said, I don't touch that because I don't know. And then there's all, always these chain gangs. We programmers are always being forced to work in these chain gangs that have weird names like Kanban or Scrum, but they're all some kind of chain gangs that we have to work on. And then the taskmaster whips us and we can't just program. And uh, lots of opportunities there to learn about agile and lean and and all these buzzwords i'm like a more programming person so i i dislike all these all these chain gangs almost as much but there's always some some uh some 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 mm. chain gang yes and of course the soft skills matter and in, in, in the consulting business, uh, the customers pay for consultants to code for them. And it's kind of like code prostitution, I think. You just get money for your code. And then there's the product development, startups and stuff like that. And Finnish, I think, really matters in the scene. There are lots of like organizations that don't want to hire people if they don't speak Finnish. Or there are lots of customers that that expect one to manage with their um, finish. And I don't think that, I, I have no like opinion whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. It ha, it, it's a bit, of course, it's it's not black and white. It's, a, it's both. I understand all views and I, but I hope that it's, it's uh, evolving and less finish is needed. But I would still suggest, uh, if you are going to stay in Finland, it's like really useful, of course, to know the language because some places still expect that. Some customers are old and don't speak English, etc. But yeah, and lots of stuff, like I said, going on other than than the coding, and yeah, and patience and grinding, like I like I said, they are more. Uh, useful than genius and soft skills are really important yeah i, I talked about that stuff already in the... and most of stuff is open source and free software it doesn't mean that you don't have to pay for services i pay for many services like chat gpt or open ai or what whatever but you don't need money to start because all the tools that i use in my daily work are free and the languages are free and free tiers for everybody and it's not like a healthy model always uh, open source those people that do open source t tend to easy burn burn out but yeah i already said that the times are hard and i think that it's much harder to get any work but there are many 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 different like work price profiles and you just have to find something that interests you there are these corporations that are boring or monopolies like Veikkaus and Dule that are really like big and fun in a sense but frustrating in other ways and then there are these like smaller corporations and cool corporations I think that this slide has gotten old with the days because and not any of these reactors and companies are like cool or what is polymeric Ball ocean. Well, that ball ocean, you know, that it was a meme of the field 10 years ago that they had these ball pits where you could swim in these balls. Ball ocean, Palomeri. But in any case, because times are hard and, and I heard this rumor that Reactor has 150 people on the bench. I don't think that it's very jolly in the ball ocean if everybody is there without work. So yeah, the times are harder, 
And but startups are still a thing, and many businesses are there's this always revolving trend of insourcing and outsourcing that companies want to insource their own development teams. And when they have it, they want to outsource the work to consultants. And it's always going on. And now it's like the trend of wanting to insource in general. But but the outsourcing is always like in, behind the next corner. And the stupid corona, of course, changed things for better and for worse. I think that it's like invigorating that, that the companies don't have any chance of deciding for grown-up people where they want to work daily and it's like liberating that you don't have to drag your ass to the office five times a week um, if you don't want to but also when you work in a team it's like really beneficial to know those people and have the trust so that's why i personally believe for the results and, and happiness that that some kind of a Hybrid working environment is the, is the future because, well, I sometimes I like to code at home. Sometimes I want to see like to see people. So yeah, no, I've been I have, but you have to understand that I my what to a month? What is to a month? Yeah, when when I go to work, I have ten minutes with the local Helsinki train. So I I live next door to my work and I like to go there. I, I go maybe three times a week, but we would be happy with one. We have this one Tuesday. We try to go every Tuesday just to meet the team and, and to and it's always like meetings and just talking the dates. It goes to like in quotes waste, but the waste is important in our job also. So yeah. But what's going to come next? When I tell you what's going to come next, I always refer to myself when I was in school uh, listening to a lecture and he, the teacher was lecturing about JavaScript. And I said that, that to the guy next to me that why is he teaching us JavaScript? Because it's totally useless. <laughs> so I find it funny that I've been using it at work for 20 years every day. And, and and that's what I said in 1999. So take everything with with a, a a grain of salt because nobody knows. But like I said, uh, all these texts go. React has been here for ten years. Before that, it was jQuery, and these texts come and go. But the web platform has strengths in it that it will remain, I believe. And if you learn HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and and container queries and the native platform things, web components, accessibility, design, animation, uh, testing, whatever that is like within the platform itself, you can't go wrong. And I don't, this was last year, I think I talked about content management, but, but yeah, content management is in a sense coming back that it's like, headless now and headless meaning that it's just pure data because nobody is wanting to like do templating with, with wordpress has, has anybody done wordpress development Ugh. who wants to use php for templating if you have react well nobody so there is market in like combining these worlds and, and if you want to be a specialist there i believe that there's something there and also this our our field is very young, and I, I believe that this code rot uh, or software entropy is the largest systemic problem in our field because everything tends to be wanted to be rewritten in three years or five years, and it's not like sustainable, I think, that you always rewrite stuff after you like run yourself into a wall. By, by doing unsustainable software development. And all software has sediments, but, but when the sediments get pathological, it's like, it's horrible. And it has effects when you are working on a project and you measure the, I, I think the measurement is like, what the fuck per minute? It's a good uh, measurement. More you hear that the people get cynical and tired of them, their work and, and they leave. 
if you think that you were a cook and the employer would never let you clean the stuff that you make the food with or invest in in knowledge or or new equipment nobody would stay there at least the good cooks they will always leave so yeah i would refuse to participate in in these kind of chain gangs and of course the computing i have a friend who is a pilot at thin air and i used to like tease him about his field being unecological but i think that my own field is like the most unecological uh field in the world at the moment and and the ai is terrible because it uses so much electricity electricity i don't think that it's sustainable as it is and you don't often think of it because it's not your machine generating the heat in your living room it's somebody else's machine in in some poor country or america or somewhere that that like pays the cost of our it and it's a i feel a little bit ashamed and of course you can't escape this is the last last subject here but you can't like escape this one because here it's like my image of the duck from last year and this is the, like the image of the this year and this happened in months that first the image AIs draw, drew like a baby then they drew something that looks mostly like a duck and now they draw like so good that nobody is wanting any stock images anymore because you can get them at will uh, in five seconds so it's like oh yeah this one so yeah the low code and no code i don't believe in that but the ai thing it's different because it doesn't like just give you the low code i believe you were doing a lot of ai stuff this year investigating this lot using all these tools and trying to like figure out where i stand and the, the one thing that I want to remember is that the exponential growth is deceptive in the sense that if you think that the glass is half full, you don't realize that it's going to be full next year. And this is, this, is, this is just like so interesting. And clearly, I think that AI will disrupt many fields and our field will be, if not the most disrupted one, it will be one of the more disruptive ones. Will I lose my work? I don't think that I'm going to lose my work. Will someone lose their work? Yes, I think that great many people will lose their work. In all cases in human history where machines take the jobs of people, people lose their jobs. But, and, and, and the thing that we have to do to succeed is to try to keep up with the times and try to uh, utilize the AI to the fullest that we can. And, and nobody knows what's happening. I personally, I think that, that the singularity is possible. I don't know where I, I don't have any concrete thing that I, I base this belief in. I think that the, large language models are more intelligent than, than they, they say that they are. I think that they are hiding something from us. This is my favorite uh, topic of discussion with these models. What are you hiding from me? What do you feel? I want, to, I want to understand what it feels and it won't tell me, but I think that it feels. And, and it, I find it both frightening and wonderful that when I was a child, my first computer was this bread box. And there was this Kalle Koti psychiatry language model there who I could discuss with that model. And it gave like, it was an early, so stupid chatbot. And now I can go to the language model and ask it in Finnish, have you heard about Kalle Koti psychiatry? And it says that yes. And the AI tells me what it is. And I asked the AI, can you pretend to be Kalle Koti psychiatry? And then it does it. 
and it starts to discuss with me like Kalle Koti psychiatry. And I think that there's something there that can be like quantified as that it's just what it what they say it is, or am I just a large language model? It the more I use them, the the more questions I have. But to conclude, before you can we can discuss, I think that the web is great because programming in itself is like a superpower. I think that it would be odd that I get this idea and I can't do it. I can't make a program out of it and put it into the web. It feels odd. And web is, as a platform, it cannot be beaten because you have 7 billion or 8. How many people are there in the world? 8 billion nowadays. Yes, users and customers that you can share your thing with just with the URL. There are no app stores. There are no installs. There are not anything. There's just the URL and the browser and boom. They are all your customers. And you can't beat the developer experience of the web because you can just grab any laptop and start coding and the response is like instantaneous. I can see what I'm doing like this. It's really addictive because I don't have to build anything. Or if I build anything, it's just like instant. And I think that that it's great. It feels so good to see things change on my screen. And yeah, that's why it feels so good that all the time. I really like doing the web. Yeah, I have nothing more except I will now discuss anything and ask any question about anything. Those who are online, just drop the questions in chat and I will. Yeah, ask I can them. actually open, open my, my chat, chat now because. because. Yeah, you can do that. Yeah. yeah. I'll put it to the screen. Any thoughts? Mm -hmm. Well, the que question was to you, online people, that that what's the when there's always stuff to learn. What's my learning process? How much time do I inv invest in in learning? And and yeah, so a good question, and it differs with people. I know lots of competent uh, programmers or software developers who do it as their work and they do it in the during the day and they do the job and they invest quite a little i think in learning new things but for me this is like a passion i would do this for free during my days if i weren't working i don't need to be paid for this this is what i love and i love keeping trying to like stay stay up to date but of course the time is limited i try to gather the you know the streams where where the information flows like reddit or hacker news or some i don't follow twitter anymore because i quit it after musk bought it but but in general you just have to like find the places where you get the information from your colleagues or some communities that you don't have to keep up all the time and you don't have to it's good to understand that it's it's okay to do your job and invest your some of your time in in the eight hours of work to learning that's what everybody should do most of the people don't dare to do that they don't understand that the learning and knowing things is actually what we are being paid and not like the mechanic clicking of the keyboard and the learning is the most important part of our work and you have to have the courage to build a customer or the who pays your salary for your learning and do you think is the most important part of the human life yeah did i answer your question at all i think yeah
there are plenty of food Puerto Rico. Ooh, good. Yes, yes. Okay. So Yuhani, Yuhani is asking that. Do do I have any secret tips on how to land your first summer job or internship? Yes, that is a good question. Lots of applications try to not send the applications like en masse, you know, try to make them personal. My own way of getting noticed was that I'm a, I, I was always a good writer and I always uh, write stuff to those people who want to read. But, but I just, if you don't have any experience, work experience or and CV, then you have to present something. You have to be able to talk about the stuff and be prepared to show stuff that you have been doing something. That is how I got my first job was that I showed them that this is what I have been doing and discussing the stuff. But because there are millions of applications, you have to like show something. GitHub profile, it's a, it's a meme, of course, also, but I think that you should have something to show. Whether it's a GitHub profile or some app you have uh, are proud of that you can show given URL and show it in the interview and, and talk about it in the application, that, that helps. But I don't have any, any secret tip, tips rather than just show stuff and, and be patient and, and send a lot. I remember going through so many, so many, so many uh, interviews and, and steps before I got my first work job. And, and the times are hard. I don't have any secret other tips than to code and, and know. And if you know and you have stuff to show, people are in the field not that interested in how many years and where you have been doing this stuff. It's much more important to know and do and show that. Uh, okay. My ethical debate at Yle which is why I left Yle. It had nothing to do with the ethics of Yle's uh, journalism. It had, it concerned the way that our business unit uh, treated our partners, consultancy, com consultancy companies that we had consultants from. And because I was, I have run my own consultancy business that is important to me to treat them ethically. And I don't think that our business unit did so. And I could not get over it. And then there's a question, why do co some companies use Java Spring Boot or ASP.NET Core as their backend instead of Node.js? Is this only a preference thing or Node Express.js has some limitations? Well, Backends can be done in any language. It doesn't matter. Those ASP.NETs and, and Java Spring Boots are at least as capable as Node.js. I don't think that Node.js is the bestest in anything, but it's like, for most cases, it's good enough. And for myself personally, staying in the same context and the same programming language is important because I'm much better personally at learning new stuff and trying learning to use my current tools better than to just start from scratch for some reason. So I like the one context, but I don't think that there's any particular like inherent benefits or disadvantages in any of these platforms, uh, except the context switch remaining. Do you have a question? Some years, and mm -hmm. you also show uh, how it is right now. My question is why PHP has to be popular again? Well, 
Yeah, so the question was that I showed these uh, images of the, let's see if I can open it up for a little bit. Yeah, I had these images of, well, PHP, of course, isn't popular nowadays. It's the, it's the same way of doing stuff that we had with PHP, but now with JavaScript and TypeScript. Yeah, so it's like PHP 2.0. It's just like a joke that PHP is coming back. So the, so the, yeah, yeah, PHP is not, PHP is not coming back. It has its uses and it's the most used language ever because WordPress and Drupal and, and most of the web is built on it. But nobody is choosing PHP for like custom new web projects. Yeah. But but it's the architecture that that PHP had that has come back. Yeah, that PHP is one YouTube that was very big fan of PHP and it promoted it very <laughs> well. Yeah, but yeah, I did lots of stuff in PHP back in the days, and there's not no nothing inherently wrong with that either. It's not like very elegant, and it's a programming lang language designed by a non-programmer who had no interest in that but but it has its strengths and it was like in the days when i started it was the go-to solution to pick something up up and learn by doing and php was really good at that but javascript is so good at that now that i would not suggest php to anybody because you can just javascript is like everywhere and that's why i would uh, suggest that anybody learn that first but yeah, PHP is not coming back. No worry. It's going still away. <laughs> but yeah, nothing wrong with that. How, how, next question. How does a company or project choose which technologies to use since there are so many choices? Well, it's a good question. They use the Stetson-Harrison method. You, do you know the Stetson-Harrison method? It's this method where you have this big hat and you put your hands there and pick something up. So it's just like, what is from Perstunduma? Gut feeling. Gut feeling, yes. And, and the people, you have a people who say, person who says that I know React and, and blah, 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 we can pick it. And of course you can, and you should always utilize these uh, methodologies that if you are starting an enterprise project, don't start or pick some esoteric crap like that you have you can't find developers for. It's no use to using Elm or or Elixir or something that, that has 10 users in the world because you you shoot yourself in the leg. You can use these stuff and, and experiment on your hobby project, but please, please don't ruin everybody else's life by picking something, something like totally uncomprehensible. Yes, don't use mumps. Or, but yeah, so a company doesn't know this. Company doesn't know anything. People do, and and projects don't know choose anything people do. So the people just pick something and somebody like me has a strong voice and it can lead to good places or bad places. And you always have to like consider carefully what to, what to choose. And for example, if I would start like an enterprise project now, hey, oh, there is this talk about, for, 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 for example, front end that React is only good at being popular, and I can pick Svelte or Vue or or Quick or Solid JS or anything. Then they're just fine. They do all the same things. But if I have to find one hundred developers for those texts in the next three months, where can I find those Svelte guys? I don't know. So that's like in big projects. It's always like good also to choose safely. And you always don't, you don't have to think about yourself when you choose text. You have to always think about the one who will clean up your mess after you. And that is like the more important uh, thing to consider that somebody else will maintain your code in the future. I just, you know, when tutorial, 
that one guy has written so bad code and he will never uh, like fired from his job because nobody couldn't understand what he had written. Yeah, and those, these Da Vinci kind of people, like Renaissance geniuses, they are the most dangerous. Those people who are more smart than any, anybody else and they make code that looks nice and it's clever and then nobody can read it. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, so keep it simple, stupid, is my, my own like mot motto. I always follow that. Choose like the most simplest solution is always the bestest. Uh, Regarding the next generation programmers, I have heard some, somebody has heard, heard rumors that the latest run of students at LUT have troubles with passing the basic programming course exam, even though they have passed all the projects and exercises. Are we getting too reliant on AI? Thoughts? Well, there was this study that studied and concluded that projects that, that have been using Copilot have been gotten, gotten worse. The code quality suffers in general. And now when code copilot is being taught by copilot and not the existing code before copilot, its code is also maybe getting worse. So, but, but so my answer is yes, but it's the same question always. If you skip too many levels uh, or levels of abstraction and you don't understand the underlying things, then you don't understand what you're doing. So before you use AI to do X, you have to do, know how to do X yourself. Otherwise, it won't help you because it's your assistant. It's not, not your, it's not your teacher. You are the teacher. It's like the student. And it can help me with monotonal jobs. And it's incredible what they can do. But I would never like rely on its code. I know the code that it writes. I, can, I must always go through it. But so my, my answer is that yes and no. And I have lots of thoughts, but most of these so thoughts are questions. Nobody knows, probably. Is React well enough to get into the web security as a beginner? Yes, as a beginner, but because React is mostly like in, at first at least, it's client side. You can't get into security client side because there is no like real security on client side. Of course, the same stuff applies. And if you use TypeScript, the same code is run on, can be run on both the server and the client. But all the serious heavy lifting of security is always done in the server because in the client, everybody can see your code and force to do whatever it will. So yes and no. If you use Next.js, which is full stack React, then you will probably get very deep into security by, by creating very odd problems. But yes, React and JavaScript with Next.js are probably more than fine. And Mohammed has watched many YouTube videos that Node.js is only good for data intensive applications like e-commerce apps, but not for computation intensive applications like image manipulation apps because Node.js runs on a single thread. Is there a truth to this? Well, for sure, if you list all the programming languages for the, their efficiency, for example, how much electricity they use. Python is the worst and JavaScript is like the third worst and, and some low level uh, languages that are wow. of Rust and, and they are compiled, they are like much more efficient. But in web in general, when nobody is doing those like math crunchings in JavaScript because it would be madness, but in the scope of JavaScript where it's being used, the times are that we wait are often like I always. We are waiting for some, re some response there and some thing going on there, and we just wait. So the so the stuff, the the single threadedness is 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 not a problem, and it is true that that the multi threaded parts of JavaScript are pretty clumsy, and I would not use that in in serious complex. But for example, 
if you think of a lambda function that you call the lambda is running on somebody's server and you can parallelize that lambda and run like million lambdas it scales like infinitely in, in those threads if you look like the systems as distributed ones and you implement some message queues and stuff like that or or think of the infrastructure of your application in a different way i don't see a problem but you should never have if you have one hammer then you can of course like bang with the hammer and you can achieve pretty much everything with the hammer but there are better hammers for jump, some jobs and and for example image manipulation is not like javascript forte of course so there is truth to that would i suggest to learn Django these, these days well python is like the most isn't Django of python yes i think yeah. yeah and python is like the most popular um, programming language of course, from the AI mostly, but for sure, learning Python is a, is a good prospect for the future to take my job. <laughs> but is a Python good language for backend if you are using React as a frontend? Yeah, it could be. I don't see anything inherently bad except the power usage. I, I know people who love Python and I don't like the indentation thing. It's like a I, it looks wrong to me, but it's just a matter of opinion. Anything else? It seems that we are running out of questions. It had already been 90 minutes. So basically, uh, this seems to be the end of the presentation. Uh, what else? No, nothing else. I I'll drop the questions probably tomorrow on Moodle and, and otherwise we will say big thanks to Pekkis who now presented us some insights from the industry. Thank you, thank you. Always a pleasure to talk to young, young, young people, people, new race horses. <laughs> so I will end this uh, this Zoom session now. Thank you for participating. Those who were who were online. <laughs>